just waiting for a confirmation that I'm live. Okay, so I can see myself live. This is a relatively new topic, protein folding, degradation, protein sorting. And uh, recent year, there has been a few questions, both in AIMS, PGI. Neat, I have not seen uh, questions on this, but for AIMS, this media examination, protein folding degradation is a quite an important topic. So let's start today's session. So let's understand the basics of protein folding. Okay. So basics, what are the basics of protein folding? So what is it? It's a process of incorporating a special conformation of protein from the basis of protein folding. So the most important conformational form of protein in biological conformation, that is 3D configuration. So basically what is protein folding? It is, you know, kind of folding the protein in such a way that it requires its 3D structure and it is able to perform its function. And what are the most important molecule which are important for protein folding? That is chaperons, okay? The auxiliary protein that assist in protein folding, okay? So when we talk about chaperons, these are, again, chaperon is a very, very high yield topic. So many questions have been asked. So what are chaperons? These are present in uh, almost uh, all the species from bacteria to human, and they help in the quality control or editing mechanism of the uh, detecting misfolded or defective proteins. So they help in protein folding. Okay, they will form the scaffold for uh, by which protein folding will happen. And also they will help in quality control of detecting the misfolded or defective proteins. Then another question which has been asked is what are the enzymes included in protein folding? So there are two important enzymes. One is protein disulfate isomerase and then there is peptide uh, propyl isomerase. So these are the uh, various, these are the two enzymes which are very important for protein folding. Now, once we have understood what is protein folding, let us look at chaperons and uh, what are the role of chaperon in protein folding. So chaperons are heat shock proteins. Okay, essentially they are heat shock proteins, which means they are inducible by elevated temperature and even various chemical. They have ATPase activity. So whatever they are doing, uh, they will use ATP activity and binds to predominantly hydrophobic region of unfolded proteins to prevent aggregation. Okay, so what are the types? Now, this is where the question has been asked. Uh, I think last year only in AIMS, a question was there. HSP 76, so HSP 70, HSP 90, HSP 40, which is also called as coliparone. Then Cal reticoline, Cal nexine, GRP 94 and BIP. All these are various type of chaperons, okay? And they, again, their main function is protein folding. Their main function is protein folding and basically detecting any misfolded proteins. Then also we have got chaperonins. So let's look a little about chaperonins. So these are the second major classes of chaperons and this include HSP 16 and HSP 10. HSP stands for heat shock protein, okay? So HSP 16 and HSP 10, okay? So this is A. These are very, very large oligo oligomeric assembly like barrel-like structure and they retain the unfolded protein whereas they will what they will do is they will provide suitable conditions for protein folding also called as uh, so if this is the chaperonin, unfolded protein, actually polypeptide gets into the chaperonin, okay? And then what happens, it forms a barrel-like structure, it forms a scaffolding-like structure and uh, which provides the right space or the right, uh, you know, folding uh, mechanism. And what happens, uh, once the folding is happened, the correctly folded protein is released. So this is how chaperonins work. Very simple mechanism. They you know, they are barrel like. So what will happen? The polypeptide will enter into the chaperonins. This chaperonins will provide a, a space as scaffolding wherein the right kind of 3D configuration will happen. And uh, what will happen is once they are inside the, you know, barrel, okay, once they are inside the barrel, as you can see, once they are inside the barrel here, so what will happen? They will start getting folded in the correct way. And once they are, they get their 3D configuration, they are released, okay? So this is how the mechanism of action of chaperonin now once we have understood so basically till now we have seen that what are what is protein folding protein folding is essentially you know uh, basically folding or formation of the correct hydrogen bonds so that the exact three-dimensional structure is formed which uh, which allows the polypeptide to do its function and the major uh, you know molecule uh, major you know molecules which are allowing it is chaperonons and out of the chaperonons, this chaperonin is essentially more important. It is the second class. Now let us look at some protein misfolding disorders. Now you will be 
so this disorders are caused due to the failure of protein to fold fold properly leading to rapid degradation so prions are cellular accumulation of misfolded or partially degraded protein so if we see protein uh, misfolding disorders they are essentially divided into two categories one is prion disease and then the second is prion related disease now again a question was 2 3 years back which of the following is a protein misfolding disease so crusfeld jacob disease is a protein uh, folding uh, misfolding disease gss is a protein insomnia fatal familial and both sporadic familial both are protein misfolding disease and we have got kuros disease when it comes to related then we have got alzheimers parkinsons beta thalassemia and amyloidosis so all these are you know protein misfolding disease which we know okay now when so what happens when a protein is misfolded so what we have seen today is what is protein folding what are the molecules which are essentially important for protein folding then we saw what are the various different you know types of protein uh, folding disorders and what happens when the protein is misfolded the misfolded proteins actually go for rapid degradation okay so misfolded protein uh, you know go for rapid degradation in fact all the proteins in the body are constantly being degraded but half life of the uh, you know half life of the misfolded protein is actually yeah so normally also all the proteins which are formed will be degraded and uh, damaged and defective and misfolded proteins are prematurely degraded now if you see protein degradation there are two independent mechanism one is an atp independent mechanism and one is an atp dependent mechanism so these there are two grossly different types of uh, mechanism which are involved in protein degradation one is an atp dependent mechanism and one is an atp independent mechanism so let's talk about atp independent mechanism so this happens in lysosome okay and this are largely for extracellular proteins and membrane associated proteins and also for long lived intracellular proteins so atp independent uh, degradation obviously because these are normal extracellular proteins or membrane associated protein or long lived intracellular proteins so they need to be in the cytoplasm for a longer time so they are depend they are basically you know they are basically degraded in lysosome they are degraded in lysosome okay and they are dependent in uh, degraded in atp independent fashion so you have to remember what are the proteins which are you know degraded with atp independent pathway is it clear so protein degrade uh, degradation in atp independent pathway is done in lysosomes and extracellular protein membrane associated protein and long lived intracellular proteins are very important for that when we talk about atp dependent pathway okay so it happens in by proteasomal complex and as you know that uh, as the name only suggest that this entire process is atp dependent okay so what are the proteins which are uh, atp dependent uh, you know uh, degraded so obviously re regulatory protein with short half lives so regulatory protein which have very short half life and after their work is done they need to be destroyed so they are generally destroyed by atp dependent mechanism and second all the abnormal or misfolded proteins so this two mechanisms you have to remember the mechanism of protein degradation both atp independent and atp dependent now atp independent is basically enzymatic digestion let's look at atp dependent mechanism in a little detail okay so when we talk about an atp independent atp dependent mechanism it is also called as endoplasmic reticulum associated protein degradation because that is where it will happen so exactly what happens it happens in cytoplasm in endoplasmic reticulum by ubiquitin proteasomal complex and it is an atp dependent mechanism so if we see this is the endoplasmic reticulum this is the misfolded protein and what happens this misfolded protein is finally aggregated and then what happens it is taken in the lysosome and there uh, from the lysosome uh, there is proteasome which will break that protein shred that protein into smaller part so this is endoplasmic reticulum associated protein degradation okay very important and the most important question which has been frequently asked on this is what are the various uh, you know proteins which are degraded by it so always remember there are two types so all the proteins with very short half life very short half life okay so those are the proteins which are associated uh, degraded with this atp dependent endoplasmic reticulum associated protein degradation and second all the misfolded all the misfolded or abnormally folded okay proteins are again degraded by this disorder so this is yeah. now here again a very important molecule exists 
is ubiquitin again ubiquitin is a very favorite mcq not very detailed question are asked but again ubiquitin very frequently is asked so this is the key molecule in protein degradation and it has a very highly conserved protein with 76 amino acid which means uh, the the 76 amino acid the sequence of this ubiquitin is conserved uh, across various species okay and there is an n end rule uh, of ubiquitin binding that is it binds to the pest sequence okay it binds to the pest sequence that is proline glutamic acid serine and threonine okay so pest sequence it will bind and once it has bind it has bind it is called as the kiss of death so whichever protein has to be degraded ubiquitin actually goes and attaches to it and minimum four ubiquitin should be you know uh, attached to that and what they will do is they will form this pseudo peptide or isopeptide which will help you know proteasomal complex to identify which uh, you know uh, which particular protein has to be degraded and then it degrades it so this is ubiquitin so most important question around ubiquitin will be it is one of the key molecules in protein degradation very highly conserved small protein and this pest sequence kiss of death is also very frequently asked okay now once this ubiquitin actually binds with the protein uh, misfolded protein or even short half life protein which has to be degraded it is brought to proteasomal complex now let us look at the structure of proteasomal complex so it is situated in cytosol okay it is situated in cytosol and has around 50 subunits of large cylindrical structure okay and uh, let's uh, try to see so this is the structure actually this is the inner core if you see so this is a large cylindrical structure if you see okay large amount of 50 around 50 subunit large cylindrical structure will be there again atp dependent structure and what happens is there can be one two regulatory uh, uh, particles or caps and what happens generally what will happen is the protein will enter here and then the degraded protein will come out okay so here it is ubiquitin attached unfolded protein so it comes to the inner protein and then it is broken down okay so a uh, very important question is uh, again around clinical side is protease inhibitor bortezomib is used in multiple myeloma for hepato and for hepatic cellular carcinoma so that is a protease inhibitor this proteasome uh, inhibitor it is so this is what uh, protein uh, degradation is so what we have learned in protein degradation till now is basically you know uh, what are uh, what is protein degradation okay and uh, what are the molecules which are important for protein degradation and how it actually happens so there are two mechanisms atp independent and atp dependent atp independent basically is the lysosomal digestion of all the proteins they are generally for extracellular proteins or proteins with strong uh, you know larger half life then we have got atp dependent atp dependent is basically by ubiquitin proteasomal complex and they use atp um, i mean energy right and they are essentially for misfolded or abnormally folded proteins as well as for you know i uh, as well as for proteins which are having very short half life so this is basically protein sorting now let us look at uh, protein degradation now let us look at protein sorting so what is protein sorting okay so protein sorting is the process of movement of newly synthesized protein to their target destination for tar, uh, for their desired function so whenever a protein is being you know produced okay so it has to actually go to the target destination like say it may go to a particular you know endoplasmic reticulum or it has to be secreted or it will go to the golgi bodies so wherever that target destination is how the protein newly synthesized protein goes to their target des destination this is called as protein sorting okay so what is protein sorting protein sorting is process of movement of newly synthesized protein to their target destination for desired function this is also referred as intracellular traffic of protein or protein localization simple to understand so what is the traffic of protein so how whenever the protein is being produced which place it will go that is what is protein sorting is so what is the control center of its, this entire thing the control center is basically the golgi apparatus the main decision making center that decides the final decision of synthesized destination of synthesized protein so this is golgi apparatus and apparently there are two basic mechanisms two basic mechanism which will control where this protein will go okay 
so these two mechanisms have two different property one is signal sequence and one is signal protein okay so these are two different ways signal sequences in the polypeptide which has been you know produced there is a special sequence and that sequence itself will decide where it will go so certain you know enzymes or certain proteins needs to go to a particular you know organelle or a particular position location so those those proteins or those enzymes will have a sequence embedded in themselves okay so a part of that entire protein will have a sequence which will decide where it will go okay so that is signal sequence and second is signal protein which means the polypeptide itself does not have a sequence which will define where it will go but golgi bodies will add a sequence to that polypeptide so this poly this signal protein will be added externally and this signal protein will decide where it will go so if the signal protein is changed the same polypeptide can go to different places is this concept clear or not is the concept of signal sequence clear or not okay so again i'll explain suppose this is the polypeptide some polypeptide will have in themselves embedded a particular sequence okay and this sequence will decide where it will go so these are signal sequence protein other in other cases what happen this is the polypeptide an external polypeptide is added okay gets associated with this polypeptide this is called a signal protein this signal protein will now decide where it will go okay so in this case as you can see the same polypeptide just by changing the signal protein it can go to various other locations and here because it where it will go is included in the signal sequence itself you know it will uh, it will go to that particular organ only so these are the two mechanisms by which sorting happen let's look further deep dive further into it so sorting process branches out depending upon the site of the protein synthesis so it can be systolic or uh, rough endoplasmic reticulum so systolic branch is basically uh, proteins are formed from free polyribosomes whereas in rough endoplasmic reticulum proteins are formed in membrane bound polyribosomes if you see systolic branch where free ribosome is producing the you know protein it has a signal sequence as i told you within the you know protein itself there will be a sequence and that will decide where it will go where when it when it is produced by rough endoplasmic reticulum what happens the rough endoplasmic reticulum gives a signal peptide attaches an external pe peptide that is called a signal peptide which will decide where it will go so this systolic branch uh, you know polypeptide is directly delivered to the target organelle and here what happens because it has a signal peptide this signal peptide has you know certain uh, what you call the receptors in organelle membrane so that you know receptor based movement will happen in signal peptide okay so here no membrane attachment is there because there is no signal protein and here signal protein aids in membrane attachment so what are the various organs where this uh, uh, signal sequence protein are used mitochondria nuclei peroxisome cytosol so these are the these are the areas where signal protein will be used mitochondria nucleo, nuclei peroxisome cytosol whereas if we talk about rough endoplasmic reticulum branch it's mainly in endoplasmic reticulum golgi apparatus and lysosome okay so this is how based on uh, where it is either it is produced by free polyribosome which will have a signal sequence or it is produced by a membrane bound i don't know polyribosome that is rough endoplasmic reticulum which has a signal peptide so these are the two methods by which sorting will happen now let's talk a little about signal sequence and targeting organ so uh, organelle so signal sequence direct proteins to specific organelles so again what are the signal sequence and which organelle it will take it to for example we have n terminal signal peptide sequence then it will take it to endoplasmic reticulum if the signal sequence has carboxyl uh, terminal of this sequence lysine aspartate glutamate leucine then it will go to lumen of endoplasmic reticulum if it has hdel sequence then it will go to again lumen of endoplasmic reticulum if had a if it has a diacetic sequence diacetic means there is an aspartic acid then there is a glutamic acid and in between there can be any other then it will go to golgi membrane if the amino dominant sequence or matrix targeting sequence is there then it will go to mitochondrial matrix if nuclear uh, localization sequence that is nls is there it will go to nucleus and finally if peroxisomal matrix uh, targeting sequence that is pts serine lysine then leucine okay then it will go to peroxisome now this actually has been asked in examination there were two options one is you know diacetic acid 
okay and then nuclear localization sequence nls so that's why i have put a table so that you can remember it now remember their traditional has been not much of questions on uh, protein sorting protein degradation you know but recently a lot of questions are being asked so that's why this is a, a relatively new topic where you will find very less questions in current pg examination but yes i believe that new questions will come from this target okay so now let's look at signal peptide so this was all about uh, signal sequence now let's look at signal peptide signal peptide is located at amino terminal approximately you know 12, 12 to 35 cluster of hydrophobic amino acid major being methionine okay and has only one positively charged amino acid near its terminal okay so what it does it it mediates newly synthesized protein from membrane bind ribosomes to endoplasmic reticulum and it forms the uh, basis of signal peptide hypothesis now again signal peptide hypothesis was proposed by Balbel and Sabatini and it different it it actually explains the difference between free and membrane bound poly ribosome so let's look quickly at the signal peptide hypothesis so what does signal peptide hypothesis say it basically says that protein are you know synthesized from uh, bound poly ribosome have signal peptide that will direct it to endoplasmic reticulum so whatever proteins who have signal peptide hmm, you know who have signal peptide attached to that they will be directed to endoplasmic reticulum so this is basically say, say this is the polyribosome and this is the nascent protein and this is the signal sequence so if you see if you see uh, this okay, if you see so this is our polyribosome okay and this is our nascent protein okay this is our nascent protein and this ns2 if you are seeing this is our signal sequence so the moment signal sequence is added what will happen it will be targeted towards the receptor so that signal uh, polypeptide has a receptor so this is the signal re receptor because this uh, signal sequence will take it to the receptor okay and at the receptor level uh, once it comes there will be opening of the receptor and through that opening the polypeptide will be discharged into the endoplasmic reticulum lumen okay so this is basically signal peptide hypothesis okay now lastly you know we have to learn about this uh, ex, ex exocytic or secretory pathway of rough endoplasmic reticulum now uh, it is basically how you know from endoplasmic reticulum to golgi apparatus and from golgi apparatus to plasma membrane how the secretory pathway or exocytic pathway is taking place so proteins are carried in vesicles so what are the types of vesicle and what is the function so one is a transport vesicle and its major function is transferring of protein to plasma membrane then we have got secretory vesicles it transports and secretes newly synthesized protein out of the cell like insulin from beta cells then we have got cop1 vesicles now cop1 vesicle actually does an in, uh, you know opposite so it will transport protein from golgi bodies to endoplasmic reticulum and that is why it is referred to as retrograde transport normally we know that from endoplasmic reticulum to golgi bodies uh, the movement is happening but in the cop1 vesicles the cop1 vesicle are important for retrograde transport which, because it will transport protein from golgi bodies to endoplasmic reticulum the opposite of cop2 uh, uh, vesicles these transport protein from endoplasmic reticulum to golgi body or endoplasmic reticulum to golgi intermediate complex so anti grade so that is why it is called as anti grade transport and lastly we have our clarithin uh, coated vesicle these are very important for protein endocytosis or late endocytosis so this will help in receptor mediated intake of uh, any uh, molecule okay so these are the various ves vesicle type again the question has been on the type of vesicle and characteristic membrane function so this is a very traditional question you should know about it especially cop1 vesicle retrograde cop2 vesicle anticrate so let's look at the illustration basically so that you can understand okay so this is the entire diagram so what happens is uh, so here we have got uh, this uh, endoplasmic reticulum from which protein is being formed and this is cop2 movement so cop2 movement cop2 vesicle what it will do is it will take from endoplasmic reticulum to you know golgi apparatus okay it will take from endoplasmic reticulum 
to Golgi apparatus and from Golgi apparatus it may go actually and be excreted out okay so this is cop one okay so from there it can be secreted as a vesicle and this vesicle can mature and go out and be excreted then we have got cop one cop one is anti-grade so anti-grade is happening is when i know uh, these vesicles are uh, transferred from golgi bodies from golgi apparatus to rough endoplasmic ectoplasm so this opposite transfer and from where does it have is basically uh, you know clarithin mediated endocytosis so here uh, clarithin mediated endocytosis is there and then we have got it in lysosome and here. so these are the various different types of transport okay uh, then uh, towards the end let's look at the clinical implication of protein sorting so there are three uh, uh, disease which are associated with uh, you know protein sorting one is perioxisome biogenesis disorder this is also called as zellwinger syndrome or cerebrohepatorenal disease okay and the defect is majorly in import of one or more proteins to perioxisome then we have got perioxisomal ghost okay what happens here is membranous sacs are there with perioxisomal integrated protein without the complement protein okay so here what happens matrix protein lacks the normal complement and lastly we have got lysosomal targeting disorders here defective protein targeting to lysosomes one so we have got all the inclusion cell disease and uh, generally it is because of the lack of targeting signal or uh, cisco uh, golgi located at phototransferase so these are the various so all you have to know is what are the various proteins so which of the following is the question would be which of the following is protein sorting disorder so all these you have to remember the name perioxisomal cost lysosomal targeting disorder or cere cerebrohepatorenal disease or zellwinger syndrome so this was a quick session i mean uh, uh, there were so many things which i have covered most of these are purely theory based there is not a lot of a questions these days but if you know you can solve uh, you know questions on uh, protein sorting protein degradation protein folding okay. so any questions any questions i'm just looking if you're live just put any questions if you want this was a hugely theory session i mean yeah. and uh, towards the end i'll just like to tell you that uh, if you want you know pdf of any session or if you want to know about any upcoming live sessions on youtube or on an academy you know there is a special uh, group there is a special telegram group okay there is a special telegram group 9494088000 okay so if you want i can add you on to that group and all these uh, you know if you want the notes of this particular slides or whatever i can share it with you or you can reach me through an academy app you can directly message me through an academy app and you can request any kind of sessions on any topic on biochemistry which you want me to take you know so with this i will like to end if you any one of you have any questions any questions anything so hope you are all you know geared up and preparing for mid year examinations remember almost every student will actually be uh, you know not preparing will uh, they will all be busy and thinking and contemplating about their neat pg ex uh, exam result what seats are they going to get what seats they are not going to get i mean all those things but a smart person will realize that all those things are outside your control all you have to do is attempt the attend the counseling and rest focus all on the mid year examinations okay it has two advantages first of all you never know you may get a very good rank and you can get a seat of your choice in your mid year examination second and more importantly is you know if you get implicated in all this neat thing okay what will happen is your preparation will be delayed minimum by 2 to 3 months and if you target mid year examination what will happen is you will completely complete your syllabus till june july may june and from june onwards you can you know completely double down on revision solving mcqs attending revision sessions and really give the best attempt for need so remember don't waste this time target the mid year examinations properly so if you have any questions related to preparation or anything 
just put it in the comment below If not, then I'll close the session. Thank you guys. Thank you very much.